So your artistic process spans a whole range of processes and different kinds of outcomes, um, working with collaborators and not, uh, from objects to projects which last a very long time. Uh, when I first encountered your work, it was in Sydney, when I saw this project called Stones to Throw, and I came across these rocks that were painted with symbols, rather like nose art uh, of the Second World War. And I thought that might be a good place to start in terms of your role and your process. Well, Stones to Throw is one of my keywords, but a modest one. So I'm glad that you came across that one first time when you saw my work. And um, my question was, when I was making that piece uh, for Concert de Lisbon, how can I be, or the work could be in two places at the same time? And uh, two different realities in completely two different geographies. So first it was an installation in an exhibition space, a traditional white cube space. There was uh, ten small stones uh, displayed like very valuable items. And during the show, one by one, they were disappearing. Mm. So there will be a FedEx guy coming and picking up one of the stones, and there will be one less. So if you're a visitor, you arrive at the show at the opening, you see all of them, all the work, entire work in the space. And if your visitor comes halfway, you see some of them are gone. And at the end, there was only one last stone left. So what you saw in Sydney was this one last stone, but empty plinths. So we maintained this 10 plinths kind of represents the story, have to be in another place. So during the show in Lisbon, um, the, the work traveled to my hometown, the Arbakers, and uh, where actually um, little kids there arrested, they were at that time, especially there was a big discussion around that issue, that they were arrested just by throwing stones to soldiers, uh, sometimes up to a year custody. So it was a big debate how to treat these uh, kids uh, under um, 18 years old and what to do with them. So I wanted to address that issue, but I was in Lisbon. So my interest was how can I address this issue from a, a small exhibition space in Lisbon and how can we be in that reality at the same time. So I constructed the entire world around this and uh, the work was disappearing from the exhibition space and appearing, it was appearing anonymously in public space. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it will arrive, a friend of mine will pick them up and leave them in the street anonymously and people will find them, they will never know actually where it comes from and who made them. Mm -hmm. And I also don't know what happens after. And as an artist, uh, that puts you in a very particular position in terms of using your perhaps position of power, you might say, or privilege as being invited to exhibit in Lisbon and in Sydney. And you're using that privilege, if you like, as an opportunity to uh, create a, another kind of project that has a different reality or different context. I wondered, do you see that as a, a resistant role? Do you see that as a way in which you're perhaps subverting the invitation to create something which resides in the exhibition for the entire duration of, say, the Biennale? Um, well, if you go back to Lisbon when I did this first, uh, piece first, I had to first resist to myself. So every time I need to re resist my own wishes, uh, what I want to have first, and not to make that priority, but make the needs of the work as priority, the narrative behind the work, the, the rumour can come out of it. That is the priority, not my own wishes. I, will, I would love to keep that, uh, those all, each stones that I spend time to make them and paint them. Uh, they are so valuable for me, in fact. So it's not an easy t to just leave them in the street. So it's a sacrifice? Um, it's not a sacrifice, it's like the, the only way the work can achieve uh, its common meaning that you don't prioritize your own wishes. Um, so in, this, in that case, it was very, very clear to me. And, uh, and, and then the story grows. You don't know where it goes. And there is an unknown part for me as well. I might end up seeing those rocks, little rocks somewhere one day. Um, so that's my interest. So my, to resist my own uh, wishes, my own priorities. But that brings other responsibility because I'm working with institutions. So 
uh, if institutions working with me, if I'm able to do that to myself, I can expect that from the institutions. Because I also think that if I only expect that from the institutions and if I'm not doing it myself, uh, that could be a problematic as well. So it's a collective resistance to make something more meaningful uh, the way it deserves. Would that be uh, the case, this, this resistance to your wishes or a strategic objective, let's say, on behalf of the institution? Is that resistance evident in, for example, when the Tate invited you to work with a community um, as part of their programme and you chose to set up Silent University? So that was at their invitation, but what was established was a long-term project which would require your ongoing involvement and ongoing funding. Do you see that in some way as, as changing their expectations of what that project would be? Yes, I mean, Silent University could easily become, like it was an art project in the beginning proposed by me, within the framework of a really uh, defined format. It, let's say it's, it was a residency, it was a long-term uh, project, but long-term means one year engagement. And I saw, I was thinking about the idea and I come up with the idea, but later I saw that it is actually, immediately after I had the idea, I was like, okay, this is even more longer term commitment from my side, also from institutions uh, side as well. It's, it requires that kind of engagement. And it, it, then it's beyond the formats that we are used to. It's beyond the format of an artist residency. It's beyond the format of um, uh, some uh, two years engagement into something uh, from the institution or from me then. Um, at the same time I wanted to I wanted the concept to be liberated so it should be liberated from me as well so I should not claim and um, ownership all the time but I should protect it as well in a way you should go for as long as it's needed. You've said uh, we should all become pranksters and tricksters in order to survive contemporary daily life. I wonder how that sense of the artist as trickster plays out when you're planning your year ahead as an artist, whether that be exhibitions or projects or long-term projects. How does that square with how your work is developing? Well, it's actually quite clear to me that um, not only me, the works I do, they take up different roles all the time. Maybe that's the trick behind. Sometimes I call myself and it's necessary as artists and often I resist to this term. Or sometimes I call myself as something else. And it's the same for the artwork. Sometimes they're being encountered as artworks and sometimes not. Sometimes completely anonymous. Like in Stones to Throw, I was anonymous in another town and at the same time I was an artist in somewhere else or Silent University, it, was an, it started as an art project, now it's an organization. And um, so it's all about this, sometimes even one day we change these roles and positions and we should always use the potential of changing that. So you enter somewhere as an artist, but you can do something else or you enter somewhere as an academician, you can do something else after that. So to, in order to have access um, uh, in our daily life, or in our planning, planning of our life, um, uh, people we collaborate, people we talk to, people we, who we work with, and, and, and the things we can achieve, the exchanges we can do, it's all about behind this um, trick, how, when and how we position ourselves. Perhaps a difficult question, but with hindsight, what made you the artist that you are? Well, um, very early age, I was interested with making art and in the beginning I wanted to become a painter. Then I thought I want to be an artist and later I realized it was more about life than the art. But what was present, what never changed, the art itself. And I believe there is no distinction between art, life and politics. And I'm not interested with wasting my time making this distinction. But I'm more interested with the transformative power of art as a tool on the way.